Hotline Miami 2 Wrong Number is a fantastically fun and brutal top-down action game that was released in March of 2015. The story is told in a non-linear fashion, switching characters and time periods after every chapter, leading to a very confusing sequence of events. Using the dates given by the game, here are the chapters as they happened chronologically. Warning, this video has massive spoilers for the story in Hotline Miami 2. It was intended to help inform those of us that played the story, but didn't quite understand all of it. If you intend to play Hotline Miami 2, I implore you, play it first. The way the story is told in the game is the way it's intended to be experienced, and is definitely way better than making it sequential. The story starts in 1985 with scene 9, as we are introduced to a couple new characters and two characters from the first game, Beard and ever silent jacket they're relaxing at a local bar and beard mentions that he is going back to camp beard and jacket walk out of the bar and meet evan a writer evan asks to take a picture of the soldiers and beard asks for a copy evan thanks them for the picture and the duo jump into the back of a truck later that night their commanding officer dispatches the unit to ambush an enemy encampment after the mission, the unit has captured some prisoners and some important intel that they turn over to their commanding officer. About six months later, the unit is relaxing on the beach, pondering their futures. Beard walks into the colonel's office to find out he's up for promotion and is celebrating by getting drunk. He mentions to Beard that they will be going home, but they still have one more mission to do. They will charge an enemy camp with just four soldiers. The colonel wishes them luck, and they head out. And by some kind of luck, they capture the stronghold. And when Beard heads out, he meets the leader of a company. The leader mentions that they've been trying to get the stronghold for weeks and suffered heavy casualties, and is impressed with the skill of the soldiers. However, he doesn't seem concerned at all about the danger that the soldiers were in. Afterwards, the soldiers are chatting about the success of their mission and want to grab something to drink to celebrate. However, they settle on water and wait for the colonel's arrival before celebrating. Five days later, the soldiers learn they still have one more mission, and it sounds like a death trap. They are tasked with capturing a power plant from the enemy with just the four of them. Suddenly, the colonel walks in from the rain with the skin of a panther on his head, and remarks that they are all monsters that enjoy violence and destruction. Beard asks him if he's okay, and the panther skin slides off. He remarks that he doesn't feel well and leaves to go to sleep. The following morning, the colonel sees off the soldiers that he's sure will leave in body bags. Amazingly, the soldiers capture the power plant and see the boss commit suicide. The power plant starts to collapse, and Barnes and Jacket walk to the elevator to escape. There's an explosion that kills Barnes and injures Jacket. Beard picks up Jacket and escapes the facility with him. After escaping, Beard calls in a Casavac and assures Jacket that he'll make it out alive. Beard gives Jacket the picture Evan took of them so he doesn't forget who saved him. Fast forward a couple months and we see Beard sitting at his convenience store. He's talking to Jacket on the phone and asks for a copy of the picture. Jacket says he'll send one when he gets a chance, and Beard says he has to go since something's happening outside of his store. He walks out and a bright flash and explosion sweep over the screen. We fast forward a few years to April of 1989 and we meet another character from the previous game, Richter. Richter lives with and takes care of his mom who is sick with an unnamed illness. Each day Richter tells his mom he's going out for a bit but he will take care of her when he returns. While he's out he's following the orders of the messages on his phone. While Richter is out killing the Russian Mafia, there is another character doing the same thing. Named Jake, he was the original owner of the Jake Mask, and also one of the soldiers that fought with Jacket and Beard in Hawaii. In June of 1989, after receiving a message, Jake makes his way to the 50 Blessings building. He meets one of the bosses and tries to propose the phone message assassinations to the man. While talking with him, he figures out that it's 50 blessings that are actually leaving the phone messages. Jake immediately becomes compliant with the idea and says he has many more ideas that he thinks can benefit 50 blessings. 
Depending on the actions of the player, Jake either succeeds in his mission and is murdered by the man from 50 Blessings, or dies in his mission. Returning to Richter, it is now 1990, and he has since been caught after his actions in the first game. He gets a visit from the janitors, whom he does not recognize. He asks why they are there, to which one replies they are tying up loose ends. But since he doesn't recognize them, it's unnecessary. They remark that he served them well and say goodbye. Richter goes out to the prison yard to find that there is a riot. He escapes the prison during the riot by dressing up as a guard. Now we move to 1991 and are introduced to Detective Pardo. After stopping the robbery of a convenience store, he leaves and arrives to the scene of a murder. He talks to the leading officer about the case so far and remarks about the media, which flashes a hallucination of two cameramen and a boom mic operator. Pardo says he'll head back to the station and on the paperwork. Afterwards, he gets something to eat and then heads home. A few days later on Halloween, we meet the fans who idolized Jacket and his slaughter of the Russian Mafia. The fans are bored with a Halloween party they are attending and decide to leave and kill for the first time. After they kill all the goons, they ride to their local pizza place and get pizza. About a week later, Evan the writer is attending Jacket's trial. He gets a lead from the testimony of the police chief about a Russian mafia club. He calls Pardo and asks if there's anyone from the club he can talk to. Pardo tells him to go to the club and ask for Petrov, and he'll give him some information. The bouncer doesn't let Evan in, so he has to fight his way through the goons to get to Petrov. When he does get to Petrov, Petrov lets him ask two questions. Petrov answers that he doesn't believe it was a vigilante movement that destroyed the entire organization of the Russian Mafia because they knew their locations too well and were much too organized. Following the destruction of the organization, they just disappeared. They captured a few of the maniacs, but they couldn't even get any information out of them. Petrov then shoes Evan out of the club. Detective Pardo arrives at another murder scene. Another person fell victim to the Miami Mutilator. His hands and feet were bound with cuffs, and the murderer strangled him. After killing him, the killer gutted him. Pardo thanks Johnson for his work, then heads back to his office. Later, Evan intends to travel to Richter's house to talk to his mother. While on the subway, Evan gets a hallucination personifying his guilt. His wife berates him on his actions, and Richard warns him that if he doesn't change his priorities, he will lose his family. Once at Richter's house, Evan talks to his mom. She says she'll give Richter his number if Richter calls her. Evan asks to look around and find some voicemail tapes in Richter's room. It's the first real evidence of the phone calls that he has. A week later, we meet Sun. He is the son of the Russian Mafia leader that Jacket killed in the first game. After most of the Russians were killed, a lot of their territory and operations were taken up by the Colombian Mafia. Sun wants to start a war with the Colombians to regain their territory in and infamy. The Colombians are opening a new strip club and have invited Sun. He decides that's where he's going to start his war. He instructs his bodyguard to get the guns ready for the assault and makes his way to the strip club. After slaughtering the Colombians in their club, Sun is celebrating. His bodyguard is reluctant to celebrate, however, and mentions that he needs to get home to his girlfriend. Sun mentions the girl is too good for his bodyguard, but that's none of his business. He gifts the bodyguard with some cash and mentions to get his girl something good. A few days later, the bodyguard tells Sun that he wants out. Sun tells him he needs to do one last mission for him, and he'll let him out. He also offers the new drug the Russians have developed to his former bodyguard. The bodyguard goes to a chop shop, kills the hoodlums, and collects the money they've been withholding. The bodyguard returns to his home and mentions to his girlfriend that he's tired and wants to go right to sleep. That night, he has a nightmare about his concern on ripping off Sun. Richard appears and says the road he's traveling is towards a dead end and he's closing in on it fast. As a final remark, Richard mentions that his girlfriend is missing. The bodyguard wakes in the morning to find the money he stole missing, 
along with his girlfriend and his car. He finds a note from her saying that he would have done the same thing. That night, the bodyguard has made his way to an unnamed bar and is sitting in a private room. He tries to call Mary another time, but she has disconnected her number. Outside, the fan's van pulls up and they proceed to kill everybody in the club. Finally breaking into the bodyguard's private room, they find him high on the Russian product and proceed to beat him to death. In his final moments, the bodyguard asks the fans to call Mary to take him home. That's all he wants to do is to go home. Pardo arrives at the scene of another killing and this one is quite brutal. The victim was dismembered, placed in garbage bags, and left as a mass of blood and guts on the kitchen floor. They found a shell casing and some fingerprints in the apartment. Pardo heads home to get some sleep. That night, he is desperately searching for something. He makes his way back to the crime scene from earlier that day to find it surprisingly clean. Walking through the kitchen to the dining room, he finds a man sitting there with his gun. Through the dialogue, it is hinted that the serial killer lives inside Pardo himself. The man asks for a hug and tries to hug Pardo, but he pushes him off and his head shatters. Pardo walks out of the room to find he is on a movie set and late for a scene. The chief of police accuses Pardo of being the Miami mutilator and tells him to turn himself in. Pardo refuses to accept that and fights his way through the police station. At the door, he tries showing his badge to the officers to dissuade them from arresting or shooting him. That doesn't work and they gun him down. He wakes up on the floor of his bedroom with the phone ringing. The caller tells him to come to the station as they have a situation. Pardo refuses, saying he's taking a sick day. He hangs up and pulls his gun from his pocket, looking it over. The situation at the station is actually unrelated to Pardo. Earlier in the day, Sun mentions that after today, the Colombians will have nothing left. He sets off with two of his goons in a black van. They arrive at a bank that is controlled by the Colombians. Sun kills everyone and makes his way to the vault to find one henchman dead already. Inside the vault, he sees a hallucination fueled by the grief of losing his father and his envy for his father's love. His father mentions that Sun can't make him proud because he's not there, and unless he realizes that, he will end up just like him. Richard appears and says the actions Sun has taken so far are enough. He will die, and there is nothing he can do about it. Two days later, the fans are in their hideout, and Mark tells them that they made it on the news the previous night. They realize that they can't just kill random people off the street now. Alex thinks of some drug dealers she met the other night and suggests they go kill them. After eliminating the people that are upstairs, they realize there are more hiding in the sewers below the shack. They kill the rest of the dealers there and leave. The next day, Detective Pardo makes his way over to Alex and Ash's house. When he knocks, Alex hides her mask and clothes under the bed and comes to let him in to find he's already in the house. Pardo asks about Ash, but Alex says he doesn't live there anymore and asks Pardo to leave. Pardo complies. He makes his way over to Port Boulevard where the Colombians are running a drug operation. He single-handedly takes down all the Colombians and returns to his car. On his way there, he sees other police officers. One reprimands him for taking on the thugs alone and com comments on his recklessness. Pardo tells the officer that if he has a problem, to tell the chief about it, and then leaves. A few days pass, and Pardo makes his way to Sun's hideout. He asks to speak to Sun, but the henchman at the desk tells him that Sun isn't in. Pardo tells the henchman to let Sun know he came by and leaves. Sun is in his office and alludes to a big plan. He sets off to the Colombian's hideout. He kills everyone inside, and makes his way to the boss's office to find a few soldiers left. He gives the boss an opportunity to surrender so long as it's within the 10 seconds he counts. As he is counting, Russian thugs line up outside the windows of the boss's office. When Sun reaches 10, the thugs shoot through the windows, killing the rest of the Colombians. A few days later, Evan is alone at home, working on his novel when he receives a phone call. On the other end is Richter. Evan asks him to tell his story and Richter agrees on one condition. He needs a plane ticket. 
Evan agrees, and Richter begins telling his story. When he is finished, Evan notices a note from his wife on the kitchen table. She says she wants to talk after Evan reads the note. Depending on the player, Evan either loses his family or reconciles with his wife. A few days pass, and the fans are hanging out in their hideout. Mark comes inside with a box of masks that he has ordered. They are all Richard masks. Tony, Alex, and Corey put on a mask, and Mark asks how they feel. The others start saying something about being on a roof, and Mark is confused. Suddenly, a phone rings, and out of excitement, Alex rushes to the phone, but it isn't any of the phones they've set up. Ash reveals it's the cell phone he took from the bodyguard after they killed him at the bar. Ash answers to hear Sun on the other end of the phone. Sun asks his former bodyguard to rejoin the Mafia. Ash doesn't say anything, so Sun hangs up. Ash exclaims that he found something to do with everyone tonight. They make their way to the building and break in. Everyone clears out a floor and says they're on their way to the roof. While they are clean clearing out the building, Sun is in his apartment celebrating with some henchmen. Sun takes four pills of the new Russian product against the advice of his henchmen. He proceeds to freak out. While insanely high, Sun walks around the building shooting his own thugs and encounters the fans. However, he doesn't see them as humans in masks. He sees them as the animals of the masks they wear. Mark is a giant bear and Sun beats him to death with a pipe. He sees Cory as a zebra that runs in and out of a room full of windows and ironically shoots him to death. Tony is a huge tiger that comes charging at him that Sun scares away with a shotgun blast. Sun finally makes his way to the roof where he sees Alex and Ash as a giant twin-headed swan. After he kills the two of them, he walks through a gate and onto a rainbow bridge into Nirvana. However, everything is not as it seems. Detective Pardo arrives at the building to find that SWAT has trapped someone in a room. Pardo walks into the room to find Tony over the bodies of Mark and Corey. Tony tries surrendering, but Pardo shoots him in the face. When exiting the room, Pardo lies to the officers about what transpired. As he exits the building, Pardo sees a body covered with a white sheet with a large amount of blood under it. That body is the body of Sun, who walked off the edge of the building to his death. Appearing on a TV show is Martin Brown, a critically acclaimed actor. As he is being interviewed, Martin reveals his violent desires, and thinks he is receiving weird looks for the interviewer. He assumes he's in a dream and tells the set to pause. As he does, one person from the crowd stands and reveals himself as Richard. Richard warns Martin that he shouldn't revel in his violent desires, or there's a grim end waiting for him at the end of the shoot. Sure enough, a few days later, Martin is killed on set by a prop mix-up. Watching the interview at the time it airs is Richter and his mother. As it starts, the interview is interrupted by an announcement that states the U.S. and Russian presidents have been assassinated by a U.S. Army general. Richter turns the TV off, and his mother puts on a Richard mask. Richard comes to taunt Richter of his coming death, but Richter understands that the actions he's done cannot be changed, and he will reap what he sowed. Richter at first assumes it's only his death that is coming. However, Richard hints that soon everyone will die. Richter understands that there is nothing that can be done to prevent it, and accepts his death. Richard ends the conversation and the game by saying, Leaving this world isn't as scary as it sounds. A few seconds later, the screen is engulfed in what is assumed to be a nuclear explosion. That is Hotline Miami 2 in chronological order. Now there may be some errors there, Martin's sequences aren't dated at all, and the only thing close to a date is a clipping in chapter 10 that talks about the controversy of making the movie, but the clipping doesn't mention anything about Martin's death which leads me to assume that Martin's death happens after Chapter 10. And judging that Richter is watching the interview that occurs earlier in the game and the interview seems to be live, it can be assumed that Martin's interview happens that night and he dies a few days later. The nukes that kill Evan, Pardo, and Jack had hit Miami, but Martin's location is never given. 
and there may be a few days between the assassination of the Russian and American presidents and the actual retaliatory attack by, the, by Russia. A few of the Pardo scenes may be out of order as well, but were put in the order they're in using the dates at the beginning of each scene and using dialogue from the characters in the chapter. Thank you for watching the video. Hopefully that cleared up some confusion you may have had during the story of Hotline Miami 2. Bye!